Hey guys, I'm uh, just wandering through Chicago at the moment. My partner's at work and I got bored and decided to go look for some vegetation. There's a fair amount of native stuff and some other stuff that I don't know that I'm going to show you guys in this video. It's probably going to be a shorter one. But I thought we'd kick things off with this beauty. This is just in some landscaping, but it's awesome all the same. This is, um, this is I believe, Rue Saromatica. The, uh, I call this the beach sumac. Look at those wonderful, wonderful winter buds with some nice imbricate imbricate action going on on the scales. Can you see that? Imbricate means it looks like roofing shingles. I think you can see that. But this is a wonderful plant. You'll get it oftentimes. It does great in landscaping because as you can see, it's not like your other sumacs. It's not a tree or a shrub. It's got this wonderful, it's more of a sprawler, I guess you would call it. A, uh, not, cespitose means clump forming. I forget what, I forget my botany word sometimes. It sprawls around a lot, you know, it takes up a lot of area. It kind of acts like, say you were going to plant like English ivy, heterohelix. What you would want to do is throw out all the heterohelix and set it on fire. And then you're going to want to get a nice bunch of this Rus aromatica. Hopefully the, uh, if you live like on the lakeshore, you, you can get the, uh, Hopefully you can get the endemic subspecies or variety, whatever it gets regarded as, and uh, get some of this popping because it's actually, you know, good for native wildlife, whereas uh, heterohelix sucks and it'll choke out a tree. So yeah, there you go. Rus aromatica. Family here is uh, Anacardiaceae, same family as uh, cashews, poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, and regular sumac. I think, I think that's a merganser out there, and I think we got a bunch of golden eye right over here. So that's pretty cool to see. There were a bunch of mallards splashing around in a puddle a couple, a while ago. But anyway, the next tree I want to show you, this is one of the few I can do by bark. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna stick to my guns on this one and call it Platinus Occidentalis because uh, I live in a fantasy world and I'm gonna pretend that the city would actually give a shit about native ecology and uh, plant the native one rather than uh, Platinus X Acerifolia, the London plane tree. The London plane tree, I'm just a purist. I'm purely busting the London plane tree's balls for no reason. You know, like, it's not, it doesn't have, like, an invasive ecology. It's a non-native, so it's not as beneficial. And I just really like the, uh, the way the sycamores look. So I just gotta, gotta talk up the native all I can. The fruits are these weird little fuzzy, see that thing hanging down right there? It looks like a ping pong ball. They're these weird little fuzzy aggregations. Oh, yeah. There you go, folks. Platinus occidentalis. Great tree in the Platinaceae. Uh, cool thing about the Platinaceae is that, like, the, uh, I think, if I remember right, the closest living relatives of this tree are native to the uh, southern hemisphere in, like, Australia and New Zealand, maybe South Africa as well, that being the Proteaceae. But, uh, yeah, so there you go. Platinus occidentalis, American sycamore. Put it in your yard. It seems to do really, really well at the edges of, like, I see this guy in like on the margins of streams and creeks a lot, so I think it likes to have kind of wet feet, would be uh, my assumption. Anyways, Platinus occidentalis. So what we've got right here is uh, pretty interesting. It's uh, probably like a parasitic or saprotrophic, not 100% sure how it's, uh, how it's relating to this tree here, but uh, this is some sort of a hydnoid mushroom. And you can tell it's a hydnoid mushroom because as you can see on the underside, there's no gills. Instead, there's those things that look like uh, stalactites, which are uh, teeth, which are the hymenial surface for these mushrooms. So just, uh, so there you go. Not all mushrooms have gills, some have pores, some have teeth, some appear to have neither, or none of the above, like the, uh, the coralloid mushrooms, which I believe the hymenium is on the outside of the, uh, it's on the exterior of the fruiting body with those. Well, of course it is, but. You know, I might, oh, fuck it, whatever. That's a hydnoid mushroom. Uh, we'll chat about this character right here next. This is another one that's, uh, it's kind of easy to do by bark, I guess. You'll note it's got these, these big, like, vertical strips in it. You can kind of see there. And in a lot of cases, they'll kind of be peeling up a little bit. This guy, he doesn't, I mean, technically they don't belong this far north, but I mean... They're gonna be moving this far north, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, talking about climate change again. Lovely lichen on that, but anyways. So yeah, this is a bald cypress, uh, Taxodium disticum. Very easy to, uh, this is uh, very closely related. Some would argue it's uh, same species as the, uh, the pond cypress or the dwarf cypress, Taxodium uh, uh, imbricatum, I think.
which is a lot smaller. It develops knees, and it's, or it develops knees a lot less frequently, and the habitat preference is a little different. Haven't done enough research to actually look at the moleculars and uh, figure out if that's like what I think about it. You know, should should the pond cypress be a different species than the bald cypress? That is, you know, I don't know. I never do the readings. I'm such a bad fucking botanist. But anyways, what I wanted to show you was uh. You can, why you can tell it's a bald cypress more or less. First off, uh, it's bald, so you know that's right off the bat. Bald cypresses are, of course, a, uh, a deciduous conifer, which is quite cool, kind of like a tamarack. But then get a look at these cones. Can I get them in the same fr No, I can't. All right. We'll do this one first. Here's the female cone, the Megastrobolus. Looks like a little soccer ball. And I'll pop this one off because it's time. Yeah. But anyway, these just split open to reveal a bunch of seeds. As you can see, there's loads of these things all over the ground. Here's last year's leaf. Got some sap on me. And here are the male cones. The, uh, the boys. The staminates. Excellent. Taxonium disticum. Bald cypress. Not seeing any knees. Probably because it doesn't need any. Because this isn't... This doesn't appear to be a particularly waterlogged area. And it's, uh... Theorized, though not 100% pinned down, I should clarify in case some asshole wants to check me in the comments, not 100% pinned down, it is kind of becoming more widely accepted that those, uh, those knees, the pneumatophores, uh, might help with uh, respiration. But again, that's not proven 100%, so uh, don't go spouting that off and saying it's a fact. So here's something that uh, you just love to see, honestly. You can see we've got like a nice... A nice break in the asphalt from where the wall meets the sidewalk here. But what we've got going on, this vine, with the, uh, you're going to want to note these little adhesive discs right here. That's how you're going to, that's one of the ways that you can identify this plant successfully. This is Parthenocissus kinkafolia, the, uh, the Virginia creeper. I believe this is, this is good Parthenocissus kinkafolia, kinkafolia, not kinkafolia inserta. Uh, because I believe, if I'm remembering right, Parthenocissus inserta uh, does not climb, doesn't have the adhesive disc, if the adhesive discs, or doesn't climb this readily. It's more of a, it'll just kind of make a mat on the ground, whereas Kinkafolia climbs. But anyways, so those adhesive discs are one of the ways that you're going to make like a winter call distinguishing this from poison ivy. Uh, another way in like the growing season that you can make the distinction between this and poison ivy is if you uh, know the difference between what three leaflets look like and what five leaflets look like. Which always frustrates me because people rag on this plant and say it's poison ivy even though poison ivy isn't even uh, poison ivy is not even that bad. You know, like you get the arushio on you and you get a bad rash, like cry about it I guess, but it's really good for the birds and it's beautiful fall foliage. So what I'm kind of telling you is to uh, grow up and embrace these wonderful viney guys because they make a great uh, native alternative to uh, shitty invasive vines. Thanks. So what we're looking at right here is, uh, I would call it a healthy Juniperus virginiana because these are generally quite weedy trees, but it's, uh, being, it's having some problems and we'll get into that in a moment. But what I wanted to show you is of course these wonderful bright blue female cones. They're very berry-like, but they're not berries because, of course, we're working with uh, gymnosperms, not angiosperms. So Juniperus virginiana, uh, the eastern red cedar, super common, super weedy, great tree, birds love it, so you know, I'm a big fan already. But the problem, oh, what's all that? Well, I didn't mean to foreshadow it this hard, but this is what a proper uh, neglect of heterohelix can cause. As you can see, it's scrambling up this juniper, that juniper, that juniper, this one, this sycamore's getting it, that juniper's getting it. So as you can see, this is a really aggressive vine, uh, quite problematic outside of its native range of Eurasia, uh, which is, of course, as specific as I care to get with heterohelix because I just don't like it very much. But uh, yeah, the bark of the Juniperus virginiana, that you can't see it because it's obscured by, again, the heterohelix, it's kind of those uh, shreddy vertical strips, very similar to what you got in the, uh, in the bald cypresses, because of course, both of them are members of the, uh, the Cupressaceae, the cypresses. Juniperus is a, uh, Juniperus being a genus in there. Ooh, it's wet. Anyways, Juniperus virginiana and some beautiful cones. Uh, let's see what else we can find. I uh, think I'm going to close the video with this one here because it's just, uh, 
This is one of my uh, all-time favorite street trees when it's not selectively bred to be a wimp. Um, look at those. Aren't those wicked? As you can see, probably pushing like two inches, probably pushing five centimeters here on some of these, on some of the branching thorns, not to get into, jeez Louise. Anyways, this guy covered in lichen, beautiful. I wonder what the, oh wow. You ever think about what the competition between lichen is like going off on this vertical surface? Are they leaching harmful metabolites into one another to, uh, to gain a greater surface area for that cyanobacteria? Is that what the, the mycobiont is doing? Oh man. I started, kind of fell into a depressive episode during my mycology course and stopped paying attention during the lichen section. Still got a decent grade though, which is uh, wonderful. But anyway, this is Gladitsia triacanthos, of course. The wonderful, the wonderful honey locust. The locusts, of course, are renowned for those wild thorns. They kind of get a bad rep because the black locust has uh, spread like wildfire. Not the fault of the black locust though, it's just a crafty guy that, uh, you know, you disturb the hell out of an area, uh, someone's going to take it over. And in a lot of situations, that's a black locust. But uh, this of course is not a black locust, this is the honey locust. Black locusts have pairs of thorns, whereas the honey locust has these wonderful, just solitary ones that kind of have, tend to have these little branching hooks on them. I don't know, I think, I've, I think I've heard that you can use these as fish hooks. Don't know if, like, that's a real thing that people actually did or if people just walk by this and make up a little, little urban legend about the nice honey locust. But there you go, honey locusts and uh, lichen competition out the wazoo. I don't, I don't know my lichens very well, but as you can see, we got a lot. I mean, I'm just strictly going off of, like, morpho species concept. You've got, like probably like three or four different colors going on in here, which I'm going to assume are three or four different species of lichen. That's probably really stupid to me. Uh, don't ever repeat that. But anyways, there you go. Some nice lichen action. Uh, let's see if I can find some apothecia, the reproductive structures of a lichen. Does not appear to be the case. All right, well, all right. This might be the end of the video, I don't know. Anyways, before I get mauled by three squirrels, just a note on the, uh, at least I believe it's the evolutionary reason for the, uh, honey locust massive thorns, you know, you, you, like I said, this tree is a native to North America, right? So what the hell? So if you're a tree native to North America, put yourself in the tree shoes, roots rather, but that's a bad joke. But, um, say you're, say you're a tree in North America. Really the only large game we have to deal with in this part of the country currently, and that's a little bit of foreshadowing on purpose this time, currently is the, uh, probably the white-tailed deer, which obviously is not, this for white-tailed deer is like a nuke for a horsefly. You don't need this. This is for, this is probably, I would presume, an adaptation to, uh, deter herbivory of Pleistocene megafauna. You know, so back when we had like those giant ground sloths roam in North America and stuff like that, I would presume, presume that these are to defend against those and not the, uh, the white-tailed deer, but that's entirely shooting from the hip. Great tree though, honey locust, Gladitsia triacanthus.